cool. All right. Well, let me take your fantastic. Thank you, Crystal. I'm just copying that. I'm going to stick it. Where am I going to put it? I'll push it. Right. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. We've got more coming. Okay. I think we will. We will start. I'm very, very conscious of sticking to time, everybody. Has, um, at the moment, I think we're still missing Florence unless she has just arrived. So we're going to start um, in just a second with Douglas. Well, I am here. You're here. You're here. Yes. Fantastic. You're here. Excellent. Um, so I'm Louise Lepage. I'm chairing the panel. Um, the panel's titled Embodiment and Movement. I'm going to stick quite strictly to that 20 minute window for everybody. Um, so that 15 minutes for papers. I'll just give our speakers a nudge at the 15 minute mark. I'll put something in the chat, say you're at your 15 minutes. Um, and I think, I think that's it. Just say welcome to everybody. And now to hand over to you uh, any second, Florence. But first, just to introduce Florence, Florence, how do I pronounce your surname? Florence is good. You you say you say in the good way. Florence is good. Flore right, great, great. Florence. Um, and is it Pignard? Oui, très bien, very good. Oh my God, brilliant. <laughs> uh, uh, so Florence's doctorate was in contemporary philosophy. Her research focuses on the question of imaginary embodiment particularly in the case of theatrical play, but also on the question of the relation between science and fiction. Flor Florence has edited a book devoted to the experience of the actor and written several articles on phenomenological approaches to the stage. Her recent research focuses on cinema and more specifically on the place of science, that is artic artificial intelligence and robotics, in the work of Stanley Kubrick. And Florence's uh, paper is titled, Robot on the Stage, Dance with Robot, From Experimentation to Experience. Thank you, Florence. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Louise Lepage. So I will share my screen just now. Is good for you? Okay, I go. No, 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 can't see, can't see the screen, um, Florence. If you got, yes, brilliant. Perfect. <laughs> yes, so we go. Um, so as you, you, you told, uh, the title of uh, my presentation is Dance with Robot. What kind of experience is this? And uh, as the title says, uh, I will try to describe uh, the experience left by a dancer during his performance uh, with a robot. Uh, to do this, I will use a psychophenomenological approach, and I will uh, precise just after uh, what it is. So uh, the presentation will be uh, in uh, two parts. First, uh, we will uh, I present uh, the show and the methodology. Um, considering this, uh, I will present the two protagonists of the show, then the psychophenomenological method applied in this study. Then we will go directly to the description. For this, uh, I will uh, show you the moment uh, which was chosen by the dancer, Tayeb Benamara. And this, this moment I, I have called uh, an uncanny hug. I will explain later why. And then we will go um, into the uh, experience, the past experience uh, lived by Tayeb Benamara, the dancer. So the two protagonists of the show, uh, this show is uh, very original because uh, on the one hand, here you can see we have the performer, Tayeb Benamara, who is a dancer, an hip hop dancer, uh, which means that uh, it is a dancer who is in some way uh, specialized in robotic movement because he has the habits of moving 
uh, as a robot because hip hop dance uh, has this kind of jersey movement. Um, um, and on the other hand, we have a robot, HRP2, HRP2, uh, which is a Japanese robot, the only one of its series, which is um, in, the, in France, in the last laboratory, CNRS of Toulouse, in the south of France. And as you can see on the pictures, uh, this is an anthropomorphic robot, which means that it has, it has uh, the, almost the same shape as a human, but it is also an android robot, which means that it can do many things that uh, human beings can do. And uh, one of its specialization, because it has many specialization, is the generation of the movements. So what is interesting to see is that we have on the one hand a dancer who moves as a robot and on the other hand a robot which can in some way um, be considered as a dancer. The methodology I applied in this study is on the one hand psychological which means that I don't pretend that I will give you a description, a universal description of every human in machine interaction, but I will just present you a singular uh, a description of a singular experience. To do this, uh, I um, used a, method, a methodology built by the psychological French researcher, Pierre Vermersch, and this methodology is uh, called explicitation interviews, which means very briefly that I help it, the dancer, the performer, to go back through his past using uh, some uh, questions uh, that were uh, that uh, um, uh, I use it to help him uh, to uh, relieve this moment. Uh, and first thing uh, about this methodology, me, uh, psychological aspect of the methodology is that my description is based, based on a significant moment uh, chosen by the interviewer, so by the performer, because we have to go into his own past and so we have to follow what was significant for him. But the methodology is not only psychological because I don't pretend that I only will describe what was left by the performer, but is also phenomenological because I will try to understand what, uh, what happens at this moment by using phenomenological concepts. So now we to uh, the uh, description of the experience left by Tayeb this evening uh, of the show. So the, the significant moment chosen by the performer um, was because I asked him, okay, so Tayeb, we will start the interview. Uh, what kind of moment can you remember very well? And he told me, oh, I have a, um, a very clearly uh, memory of a moment that was uh, really deep for me uh, because I had to go towards HRP2 and uh, to hug it, then I was waiting that it, it uh, hugs me um, too. And at this moment, I remind that I had a very big anguish feeling, a very big anxiety feeling. That's why I can remind very well this point. So to understand, and that's why, as you will see later, I call this moment an uncanny hug. To understand, uh, uh, a very important aspect of this moment, we have to understand to see too that at this point, uh, the human and the robot were sharing the same kinesphere. And what is a kinesphere? Kinesphere is a concept or empirical category, which comes from, I don't know if you can see here, uh, which comes from a, co uh, a choreographer, Rudolf Laban. And uh, it is, um, an ID uh, to, um, which means that, oh, sorry, um, uh, which describes the imaginary sphere formed by all the motor possibilities of a performer when this performer doesn't move from one point but can move all other limbs. So, as you can see here, the Tayeb and the performer's kinesphere 
is completely closed because at the, this moment, the performer can't absolutely move. And it cannot move for two reasons. First, because as you can see, the robot uh, uh, is closing its arm on him. First reason, but the second reason is because uh, the dancer can absolutely not touch the robot because if it touches it, the robot can create or generate unexpected movements. And in the worst situation, uh, it can kill him because it can do, um, not stop its movement. So when we go um, a more in a more detailed way to, into this uh, uh, moment of merging of fusion kinesphere and of anguish feeling, uh, we see first that there is a mental activity because I asked uh, to Tayeb what happens at this moment. And he told me I was counting the bits. So why is he counting the bits? Because he knows that at the number five, the movements of the robot has have to stop because if they don't stop, it means that the robot can kill him. So he's starting a mental activity, like he's counting the bits. And after a little time, after a while, uh, comes a second mental activity, like a safe talk, because the, a little sentence is crossing his mind and he's thinking, and if it wasn't going as expected. And what is really interesting is because it is exactly at this moment that the anguish feeling starts, that you can see that this overturning moment comes with the possibility of the unexpected, which is intrinsic to living arts. But um, 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 one uh, other aspect that is really important to know, to understand uh, why this anguish feeling comes, is because at this point, at this moment, the dancer realizes that his partner is not a human partner. And that also, if something happened that wasn't expected, uh, the partner doesn't will react in the same way that a human being, which one Tayeb usually has the habits to interact and which one he can bodily con communicate. But in this way, he is in the impossibility of acting directly and spontaneously on the machine in the case of something happened that wasn't expected. And that's why come the comes the anguish feeling. Other thing very important is that at this moment, there is this fusion of merging kinesphere,s and the uh, dancer can absolutely not move. And um, this merging kinesphere is, is creating something like we could call an anguish loop or an anxiety loop because the immobility that the dancer wants because it doesn't have to touch the robot is at the same time what gives or increases his powerlessness feeling in the case that something unexpected happens. And that's why he's feeling internal sensation of the anguish feeling, because he has something, um, he, he has a feeling of cold, which is happening on the top of its back. Conclusion one uh, of uh, this um, um, uh, study. There is at this moment a spatial fusion because we have seen that uh, the kinesphere's of the robot and the human were um, uh, fusional, magic, but there is not a confusion of their bodies. And this is really important to see that. Why there is not a confusion? First, uh, we can um, uh, read the sentence that Tayeb uh, told me as I was asking him what, what's, what was happening uh, during this moment, he told me if it tightens, it, this is the robot, if the robot tightens, it squeezes me, it hurts me, if it hurts me, it touches me, if it touches me, it is unbalanced and I could not carry it. So first thing really important that you can see here is that the human and the robot movements are completely interlaced, 
which means that if something happened to the robot, it can have consequence on the human and conversely, first important thing. But the second important thing that you can read in this sentence is that Tayeb clearly does the difference between the two types of body. Indeed, he, speak about, he speaks about his own body like something that can be hurted. So his uh, experiences, um, experiencing, sorry, his own body as a flesh body, what phenomenology call flesh body, which is uh, a body that can feel from inside uh, what happened on him. So it's a body that can suffer. It's a body that has a sensibility. But uh, on the other hand, he absolutely doesn't identify uh, the body of the robot as the same of uh, his own. On the contrary, the body of the robot is uh, experienced as uh, something that has another kind of sensibility because, as you can see, it can be unbalanced if we touch him. But this body cannot feel from inside what it is doing. And that's why it can become dangerous in the case that it does unexpected movements because it cannot feel from inside what it is doing to the human body. So there is a spatial confusion, but absolutely not a confusion of their body. And that's why we come to the conclusion too, that uh, this uh, experience, uh, Levit experienced by Tayeb and the, the, by the performer is a kind of uncanny experience of their body. Um, I uh, intentionally take the uh, word of uncanny from the um, Japanese roboticist uh, Masahiro Mori to describe this kind of uh, strange experience that someone can uh, live uh, when uh, his interaction with a robot um, is not uh, agreeable. And in this case, we can see that um, in the human machine interaction, when the speciality is fusional, human can have an uncanny experience because it doesn't feel more free of his movements and he experiences the interesting distinction between his living body and the robotic one. Thanks for, for your attention. Brilliant. Thanks, Florence. That was super. Thanks very much to time. Um, okay, could I... <clears throat> I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump in. Please put your hands up, anybody, um, if you if you have questions. Um, I'm really intrigued. Uh, we we've talked quite a lot uh, about in the panel that I was in yesterday about and the day before with touch um, and that kind of that distinction between this realization, this uncanny moment where we move from. Um, kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm engaging in an action that's very human, yeah. hugging, hugging, that's very, actually, it makes me think about Micah's, um, uh, you know, paper and, and how we relate to each other um, and, and, and other things. And there's this, then there's this moment um, of realisation of the other <laughs> that's exactly very familiar frame um, that's a very human frame but what I'm really struck by with this moment this very sort of hug caring nurturing sort of gesture is this really high stakes high risk um, I was I was very much struck by the could you say a little bit more about the robot itself um, I mean you were saying that actually there's real risk to the dancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could you expand yes. on that? Um, I, uh, I'm not sure that there is, um, objectively, there is a, a high level of risk. Uh, but in the, um, in the uh, performer's feeling, there, there is a big feeling of uh, anxiety uh, because there is a big feeling of risk. 
and it's true too that uh, this moment is really special because um, uh, of course I didn't have the time I had uh, uh, just a uh, 15 minutes to speak uh, about but uh, about this moment but uh, there are four moments little moments before uh, in which during uh, during which uh, the um, uh, the performer was absolutely not afraid and was uh, uh, had was very confident in his interaction with the robot it's only at this moment in which he can absolutely not move and uh, uh, that he experiences these big differences uh, these big differences of their body uh, and uh, because he cannot move i think because he cannot move uh, uh, these big differences becomes something that creates an anguish feeling or an anxiety, an anxiety, because uh, at uh, during others' moments before, he can uh, feel uh, uh, the difference between uh, the his body and the robot's body, but it's not something that uh, uh, creates uh, an anxiety. So it's really. Um, and that's why I, I thought that it was really interesting for the um, uh, social robotics studies because um, it's um, it's just a singular experience. So maybe we 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 would have to work more and to do more uh, explanation interview with other artists. But uh, it shows that there is something like um, a limit, a spatial limit uh, in their interaction uh, with um, machine. Um, and the spatial limit is not an objective spatiality, it's really subjective spatiality. As you can see, the spatiality um, about what I spoke is not something objective, it's not the physical space, it's the, bodies, the bodily uh, space. This is the possibility of movements, this is what I can do, how I can move, and if the human being feel that it can absolutely not move because of the robots, I think that maybe we could say because it's just an experience, but it could create something like a big anxiety. Mm. I don't know if I answer well. Yeah, no, that's um, fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Um, we've got one minute to take another okay. uh, question. And uh, Sylvia, I'm sorry that I hogged the first question. I'll shut up it after the next paper. Over to you, Sylvia. Oh, you're on mute, I think. presentation and the phenomenological approach of um, of uh, Florence I was very uh, uh, happy to discover that there are other dance uh, studies uh, concerning HP4 HRP2 I'm currently working with the HRP4 and in my paper earlier um, I can give you insights about uh, these uh, physical capacities of the robot because uh, it's part of, uh, of the research of the dance research that we are doing here at Lierm. And for the HRP4 one, for uh, the most the, the updated version of it, the danger uh, factor is not uh, it's excluded because the robot is very compliant and has like uh, the height of 150 centimeters and 40 kilos. So personally, when I work with it, uh, to this uh, we are aiming also a physical physical approach. There is no danger involved, but I can imagine that at that time, and we should also consider this. Uh, um, uh, improvement or updates done in the machine, this uh, the danger factor is not to be excluded. And as we've seen yesterday uh, from the presentations uh, in the roundtable of Martin, for example, when exactly. working with, uh, with, exactly. with very dangerous machines, yeah, this um, this is a very important factor to to consider. So, thank exactly. you. It was a nice discovery to see, and I'm curious to learn more about the work of. Um, this choreographer so we can complement our current absolutely. studies. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you, Thank you ever so much, Sylvia. Thanks, Florence. You're welcome. Um, I'd like to introduce now um, uh, Douglas Doug Eco. Um, now, Doug is an assistant professor at the Centre for Drama, Theatre and Performance Studies at the University of Toronto, where he also serves as the academic assistant director of the BMO Lab in Creative Research in the Arts, Performance, Emerging Technologies and AI. 
Douglas is researching the relationship between 20th and 21st century theatrical performance, computation and political economy. He's working on a book currently tentatively titled Boxes of Glass, How Theatre Became Automatic, where he's tracing the history of attempts to automate performance production from surrealism to digital light control and computational writing. Doug's paper is titled Becoming Automatic, Algorithmic and Robotic Performance after 2008. Over to you, Doug, thank you. Here we go, thank you so much. Uh, all right, assuming you can all hear me, we'll move ahead. Um, why has the past decade seen so many robotic and algorithmic performances? Just starting my timer. In this talk, I'll discuss these two genres together as cases of automatic performance, performances in which technical systems attempt to cut past human labor to present scores directly to audiences. I propose that this late fascination with the automatic is symptomatic of global economic stagnation, a condition which has become harder and harder to deny since the epochal crisis of 2008. It is this backdrop, not one of digital innovation, nor of new materialist enlightenment, that I urge scholars to erect behind the automatic forces we find on our contemporary stages. To begin, I should establish that these associated trends can, in fact, be located within the 2010s. Of course, both robot performance and algorithmically scored performance have long histories, dating at least to the post-war period, if we opt to restrictively define the genres by reference to digital computation. The 1950s and 60s see a burst of robot performances put on by cyberneticians, mostly at expos and science festivals, uh, while the 60s and 70s see a turn to computationally produced music, painting, and even plays and dances, participating in the greater conceptual art movement towards mathematically defined scoring. And um, my article on the dances of this era has just been published in Theater Journal, uh, and I'm moreover writing a book on this longer history. Uh, so though today I want to periodize an increase of such performances over the past decade, and moreover insist that these recent performances have a particular character when contrasted with the predecessors, I'm acutely aware that there's little new about the idea of robotic or algorithmic performance. In writing this history, however, I have noticed a sharp decline in such work between 1980 and 2010. While there are many exceptions, what we do find as the paradigms, what do we find as the paradigms of digital performance in this era? Telematic performance, multimedia performance, virtuality, interactivity, and above all, the cyborg. The emphasis is on computation as an extension of human capacity one whose blurred performances of human intentions both suggest expanded ability and alienated self-identity. Humans, in Matthew Causey's term, become embedded in global technical networks. The performances of the period explore what can be accomplished and what individual autonomy must be shed in facing this highly dispersed social reality head on. The Worcester Group, Stalark, George Coates, Guillermo Gomez Pena, Lynn Hirschman Leeson, the Builders Association, these artists explore digital and cinematic technologies and performance in nearly every direction, but none of them make robots or write algorithms. When then do digital performance artists make this turn back to robots and algorithms? Let's look at the most widely cited instances. So across these works, we see some secession of tropes. First, an interest in sort of non-human stages in Goebbels and uh, Castellucci. Uh, then uh, interest in the algorithm and Dorson's early work, then more robots, and soon we were very recently we're seeing more of a burst of interest in AI, but all together occupy this 2007 until the present period. Though our field tends to have a recency bias, surveying the examples of robot performance found in this symposium's book of abstracts, I count one case from 1987, one talk on work from the aughts, and a few dozen case studies cited either from the 2010s or as an ongoing contemporary practice. If we are to allow any periodization, any study of the uneven flow of tropes across performance history, we can acknowledge that automatic performances subsisted on the margins of digital performance for decades, but then became a central area of activity beginning in the pivotal years of 2007 to 10 and continuing through the present. This shift begs for theorization of its causes. 
I believe the extant scholarship, which generally is not considered robot performance as a historical question, provides two potential answers, digital, innova uh, digital innovation or the new materialist turn to the non-human. The first, the theory of 21st century innovation, can be quickly dismissed. As already noted, robots were performing in the 1950s. Even when computers were expensive and formidably difficult to code, artists in the 60s used them intensely. Though the past decade has seen real technical advances in robotics and especially in AI, the most discussed examples of robot and algorithmic performance have not employed these advances. There is no major recent advance found behind Hanson Sophia or Hirata's various robots or Annie Dorthin's Markov chain structures. Each draws on long-standing technical principles. Something else has propelled them to be created and to be received with such wide attention. Does the non-human or new materialist turn provide an answer? On this theory of anti-anthropocentrism, the climate emergency reminds today's humans first of our lack of ideational autonomy against the force of the material world, and then of the need to accelerate this impotence to plot our position ever further out from the center of our map of historical forces. Robotic and algorithmic performance dramatized the surging agency of materiality against our will and self-regard, issuing the cold truth that humans must make way for a world of things that do not care about us. This story neatly aligns with that of automation discourse, which has also greatly increased over this past decade. The idea that the economy will soon power itself without human labor, that robots and algorithms will successfully displace us. I have two objected, uh, objections to this account. First, I find no political utility in the non or post human, as only humans have the capacity to upend the ultimate cause of, cause of the climate emergency, capitalism, and create a system where our social wills might actually find a our current regime through which the inhuman teleology of capital drives us to our demise. Second, risking banality, I would point to the representational content of the performances themselves, which rarely, if ever, gesture to oceans, heat, or non-human animals, instead populating their stages with the tools. Consider the MacBooks on the stage of Hello Hi There and Uncanny Valley, the domestic workers of Hirata's two robot plays, uh, or the factory labor of Castellucci's Sac du Pantin. These are the mise en scène of the workplace. More surprisingly, and with no mid-century precedent, observe the recent pattern of industrial robotic arms in the dances of William Forsyth, Katie Kwan, Madeline Gannon, So Gwen Chung, and as presented yesterday, and uh, Michael's with us now, Michael Bergman and Belinda McGuire. These instances suggest not climate change, but the worlds of work and market. They ask the question, what impact has digital technology actually had on the global economy? How do computers actually relate to the productivity of human labor? As it turns out, not very much. As Aaron Benanez has argued in Automation in the Future of Work, as says Jason Smith in Smart Machines and Service Work, the central claims of automation theorists that computers are increasing the productivity growth of firms, substituting for human workers, and depressing employment are each measurably false. Since the 1960s, the rate of productivity growth has declined, first in the United States and then spreading through European, Japanese, Latin American, and now even Chinese economies. The global slack demand for labor derives not from the increased productivity of those who are employed, but rather an overall stagnation of economic output. The capitalist or at least neoliberal system appears to have hit a limit of overcapacity. Simply put, the problem is not that robots are making goods instead of people, but that people cannot buy the goods other people are making. This is known as Solo's paradox. Computers have increased control and the surveillance of workers and have depressed the bargaining capacity of labor, but unlike earlier technical innovations, have not pr increased productivity growth. Nowhere is this more clear than the service sector, the world of affective labor that many scholars have argued is fundamentally tied to theater and performance. There, despite the now popular discussion of threats from machine learning, computation has created plenty of jobs, but meager part-time piecework contracts that function under intense surveillance and control. 
as the monopolization of labor time becomes ever more essential for squeezing productivity out of a form that is human labor power that seems to have hit its limit. To capture the significance of this story for the performing arts, consider the modernist celebrations of mechanized productivity, which depicted humans and mechanized manufacture as a productive source of energy, as discussed by classic texts like Robin Bach's Human Motor or McCarran's Dancing Machines. Especially in the Soviet Union, the worker machine assemblage was staged as a site of autonomous generation and spontaneous release. RUR and other technophobic pieces of the era merely inverted the same narrative into a dystopic one. There was no question of the association of mechanization with productivity. This classic modernist technophilia provides a fascinating contrast with the more propagandistic performances of automation today, such as the Boston Dynamics robots or Amazon's Astro, in which robots advertise the futurism of large corporations, but plainly do not produce. Both canines sell surveillance capacity, moving around cameras for the police or for homeowners. They do not make things, but protect the things the wealthy already have. They stage preservation, not generation. Since the 2008 crisis, I would contend, the limit of this economic system's growth has been felt by all. Even our propagandistic automation performances stage stagnation, underemployment, and the drive to control labor rather than improve it. This late turn in the performing arts to automatic spectacles over this period of now undeniable stagnation has staged the post-2008 situation with far more specificity than has its corporate advertisement. Consider For Claude Shannon, a dance by Paris-based company Le Principe d'Entretitude. The dance works from algorithmically generated text much as had Annie Dorson's theater on which Pierre Rodin, co-founder of this company, worked as an engineer. The text is simple, a single English sentence produced anew minutes before each performance. Four dancers then spend the hour long dance performing it. They do so by means of a semaphoric system in which each English letter corresponds to a four step, 16 count sequence. Face, starting by facing away from each other, they try to apply their code to an already code-dependent text. This task is apparently impossible. The dancers make constant mistakes, visible as they slip out of synchronicity over the hour. The dance moves themselves, all involving extended arms, become physically unsustainable at length. At points, the dancers begin shouting out the letters and words they think they are on, but rarely seem to agree with dissenting opinions. Though all are supposed to dance the same algorithmic dance, each dancer focuses intently on performing correctly rather than matching their partners. By the midpoint, each dancer moves through a completely distinct sequence, each convinced they have it more right than the others. This is a dance in which digital logics are aggressively entropic. The algorithmic structures of the dance, as invisible to spectators as is code to a computer user, drive dancers to incoherence and chaos. The strange quasi-semantics of the machine learning source sentence inhibit dancers' capacity for memory rather than supplementing it. The dance stages its own de-skilling of its dancers. Rather than produce, they find themselves consumed by their own encounters with the workplace machines of our day. These dancers are busy, working, and building nothing with their own work computation as a generator of stagnant, not energetic, performances. In their relative collider, a man on stage does nothing but read rapidly from a MacBook running algorithmically generated text, whose scansion the dancers then use as a choreographic structure. Again, a scene of contemporary work, the transcription of nonsensical strings on a laptop, presents itself not as a productive source of energy, but as a task which tightly grips bodies and sets them to tasks which accomplish nothing except exhaustion. Bodies express both their lack of value and the dependence of automatic forces to work through them. With this keyword of stagnation in hand, we can use, we can trace the constellation of late automatic performance. Robot arms and their dancing partners do not build together a notable absence when considering machines designed for productive construction. The face replica creations of Orizo Hirata's Sayonara or Rimini Protocol's Uncanny Valley 
express a shrinking of valuable human action to the affective creations of facial motion. These static robots, so far from the RUR ancestors, cannot interact with the world. They literally cannot labor and only generate facial and gestural images, a reductio ad absurdum of service work as economic exhaust. Against the anti-anthropocentric interpretation, these are performances about joint human technical incapacity, not techniques displacing the role of the human within a secure frame of productive employment. The fashion of new materialist theories has fostered a fundamental scholarly misinterpretation, imagining these as performances of success when they are performances of failure. Looking at the era in which they have been made, what else could they have been? Thanks. Thank you, Doug. Thank you very much. We've got time perhaps for one, one question. Um, has anybody got a question to put to Doug? I don't want to hog again. If somebody else would like to come in. If, I mean, if, if not, so, this, for me, Doug, this is, um, so whereas, uh, particularly the work at the end, um, reflecting on it, I'm, I'm sort of, I don't know, it's slightly depressing, human beings disappearing from the stage or being overwhelmed by automation and, and algorithms. And it just makes me think about the work that Pablo was sharing yesterday and the dancers, sort of the movements of, of the dancers being uh, choreographed by software, but there was a sort of exploration, a joy, a creativity to that. Your framing here is very different to that. How would you place the work, you know, Pablo's sort of work, that sort of inquiry relative to your framing here? Yeah, it's a great question. And I regret that I wasn't able to make the talk yesterday between teaching and the time zone difference, it's been hard. Um, so I can't speak specifically to that work. Uh, and sort of easy way out would just be to say that, uh, you know, uh, I think the preponderance of work has more of this uh, darker cast to it uh, and, and <laughs> simply make it sort of a majoritarian claim, which is, is sort of unverifiable. Uh, but I think the more, uh, I think the stronger claim I'd want to make would be that even this work, which uh, is claiming to find uh, a kind of joy uh, in this algorithmic choreographic creation. Uh, and that was, by the way, very much the, the vibe of the work that was done in the 1960s. Um, that even this work is expressing an inability of creating this joy through human scores and planning. Uh, even that work, by inference is saying uh, this is a type of joy that we feel we cannot make for ourselves. And I think this clearly relates to a sense that uh, the workplace, especially in the sort of classical imagination of production, in which you progress from a sort of blueprint or plan into a thing made out in the world, that this feels a seems a framework that can no longer easily apply to our own experience. So you know, if the uh, if one wishes to hope for some kind of joy left over from the, this system that seems out of our control, then I mean, one can one can hope for this and have this sort of optimistic cast, which I wouldn't. But it still seems to admit the inability or lack of functioning of these broader structures, which to me are mimetic of the global economy writ large. Thank you so much, Doug. Thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome now, now Van Bala. Um, now, Christoph is a postdoctoral researcher at Antwerp University and also a dramaturg and longtime collaborator of Chris Verdonk. His research interests are posthumanism, the non human, ecology, and end times and extinction studies. 
In his work, Christoph seeks to analyze the dramaturgical strategies that directors, choreographers, visual artists, and performers develop to tackle these issues. Christoph's paper is called Spectral Machines. Over to you. Hi, uh, thank you, Louise, and hi, everybody. Nice to see some familiar faces and to get to know some new faces as well. Um, yes, maybe my talk will be like a case study for, for Doug, who we will find out um, later on. Um, it will take a more dramaturgical, philosophical approach, um, and it's kind of like the kernel of a new research project I'm trying to write, um, with the emphasis on trying. Um, but I'll just start by sharing my screen, and then we get going. Um, should be this one. All right. Um, so um, I will be talking about um, my longtime uh, collaborator, uh, being Christopher Dunk, um, who is a Belgian feasible artist and theater maker, who has since the beginning um, explored how dehumanization and capitalist fueled technolog technologization have brought humans and non-humans subjects and objects into an ambiguous gray in between zone. This has led to dancing machines, formative figures uh, on stage consisting out of human performers and machinic contraptions, or for example, musical robots. In this presentation, however, I want to go a step further and focus on the more recent performative objects and machines in Verdunck's work. These challenge our notions and conceptions of what is usually considered to be a robot and push it beyond the uh, anthropomorphic shape or any transhumanist dream of eternal life. Data-driven consumerist capitalism intertwined with an eco-catastrophe and the advent of the so-called Anthropocene have changed the nature of the gray in-between zone in Verdunck's work where these humans and non-humans uh, dwell. It has changed from uncanny valley into a spectral plane to use a uh, concept by Timothy Morton. Robots and machines can no longer be considered as the separate, separate from ecology. And I will try to analyze how Verdun's latest machines have become spectral figures in that sense as well, as they confront their spectators, but also maybe their fellow human performers with ends. In a shift from the post-human to the post-humus, um, thus making the post quite literal here uh, in post-human, um, they are prefigurations of extinction, um, of absurd nothingness uh, and of a world beyond human presence. So let's let our first ghost enter the stage, if I manage to reach it. I just made it go away. Um, let's try again. Yeah. Voila. The golden oldie. Um, for Dunk's work has often reflected on ends, with ends of which you see now an image uh, in 2008, so around the cutoff time that Doug mentioned, being one of the most explicit ones. Um, ends in this performance were mostly caused by human inventions and profit or political oriented aims of progress, such as the atomic bomb, other nuclear disasters and catastrophes connected to industry and extraction of fossil fuels, but also the many wars that made the 20th century what it was. In a later performance, untitled, this end state was transformed into an end of theater, or maybe an end of performance, as Peter Eckersall has once called it. In this show, a mascot performer is thrown on stage, exposed to the audience, and forced to perform or else. What happens, though, is nearly nothing and his merely being present becomes the drama in itself. Performance almost comes to a standstill in the face of disposable human labor. It verges on the threshold of literally post-human and shifts from a kind of performativity that constitutes something, that produces something, to a kind of non-performance that produces, well, nothing. Um, like the performer here, the theater gets exhausted as well. The violence and the uncanniness of underlying this nothingness and exhausted theater are made tangible by a series of performative objects in this performance. At two moments, large inflatable shiny tubes emerge from boxes on the stage. They go up and down and produce an industrial soundscape. 
these machines, robots, if you like, could be referring to the inflatable advertising men uh, or to a spectral show of spectacle, to a shiny yet gloomy and industrial variation on a bouncy castle as a token of infantile entertainment or any other image that comes to your mind, of course. These inflatables are called bogus, um, more or less a synonym to fake, made up, but also close to boogie, a kind of horror style ghost. To us, uh, and I mean Chris and me, they were uh, like what Joseph Vogel has called the specter of capital. Financial markets and speculative values that are made up of thin air, but nevertheless are the background and maybe even the foreground in terms of the agency of the world's economy and have a very concrete impact on people's lives. They are also maybe the ghost of automation, of superfluous workforce, replacing a human performer or worker. The gloomy light and mysterious appearance and disappearance of these inflatables make Bogus into an uncanny presence on stage, which is confirmed um, when a robot mascot joins them on stage. A going round, making circles, performative flower, you could say. It's a little robot. Um, it looks, it has this face. Um, confirming actually that human performance, um, or the human mascot at least, is uh, morphed or maybe replaced by machines. Bogus, in that sense, is could be seen as a specter of technological and socioeconomic game overs for human performance and labor in a mechanical world, smoothened by entertainment. I focused on these bogus um, installations because five years later, we returned to the similar kind of technique of inflatables in a performance called Something Out of Nothing. Um, so here we reuse the system of bogus one, large inflatables appearing and disappearing in a specific kind of fabric. And uh, we called these ones uh, bogus three. There was bogus two in between, but I'll not talk about it now. However, as you might see, um, these inflatables now appear from above in the theater tower, growing downwards towards the plateau. The fabric is now the black velvet that we know from theater curtains. They are no longer a uh, temporal appearance at certain moments in the show, but are almost continuously present and disappearing again. What has happened here is a shift from the ghost of capitalism, a replacement by machines, to machines and objects that also remind of extinction and a world without us. But then from an ecological perspective. The exhaustion and finitude of the 21st century that made thinkers like Mark Fisher or Bifo Berardi write about the slow cancellation of the future was caused by the sensation that although life goes on, time or history seems to have stopped. We have stagnation with large systems such as humanism, capitalism, and the nation state running out of steam, but still persisting in ever more violent ways. This exhaustion of systems that together made a particular world is increasingly accompanied by another exhaustion, namely ecological exhaustion of resources, biodiversity, of human lives, and of the landscapes and ecosystems these lives are part of and have built meaningful uh, relationships with. The spectral quality of non-human performers, such as these inflatables, changes along these lines as well. From the uncanny valley type uh, of unsettling encounters with unexpectedly living or animated objects, towards an ever more intimate experience of finitude and estrangement of an environment we are entangled with in ever more alienating ways. For as Timothy Morton suggests, knowing more about these encounters and ecological dynamics does not per se lift their weirdness, on the contrary. And Morton's description of ecological experience is of course in itself influenced by the OOO, uh, Object Oriented Ontology. The uncanniness of the spectral encounters, or rather the spectrality of being ecological, is for him a consequence of the tension between appearance and being. Both the involvement of humans in the Anthropocene and encounters with ecological beings are spectral in that sense. One cannot grasp them as such. They are only mere symptoms of something bigger, of a complex chain of feedback systems and other connections. This Discrepancy indeed turns these encounters into something haunting, 
maybe our era also into a haunted era where appearances are not what they seem and actions are embedded in larger hyperobjects, but we cannot really grasp the full consequences of them. Performative objects here in Mr. Dong's work or in something function in a similar way. They are in their appearance entities on stage, sculptures, weird forms, a kind of dark garden of Eden. I think I have a better picture of that. Um, that comes and goes, expands and retreats at an enormous scale from six to eight meters tall. Um, and the light again um, makes them hard to see or to fully grasp their um, size or form. They seem to be part of a larger system, of a larger dynamics beyond the scale of the stage. And while there are still human performers on stage at times, these non-human performers already suggest a time after uh, extinction, and I mean human extinction in this case. Now, the spectral presence of the inflatables also spectralizes these human performance, performers, placing them under the horizon of their own absence. The performers, however, seem to go on to endure, but give up the search for a meaningful performance or life, or they end up in absurd situations when they still try to adhere to a logics to make sense that no longer functions. This is a theater after extinction, to use Richard Grusin's notion, where the impact of technology on human lives not only makes clear that non-human entities have agency, but also that human presence is um, final, or that could be ending. Um, for, Gruz, for Gruzin, being after extinction is not a temporal after in linear sense of time, but rather it means that these are ends that are already on their way, already on the horizon and looming over the present. In that sense, these, perform, these spectral objects on stage are um, performing uh, an end that casts a shadow over the performers. Looking at Ferdong's trajectory, uh, zooming out of it, it is interesting to see how his posthumanist artistic strategies to give shape to the fundamental relations between subject and objects, most, most technological, technological in kind, gain a new impetus, nuance, or relevance in the face of extinction and climate catastrophe. This mirrors also the returned relevance of atomic bomb thinkers such as Günther Anders in climate crisis theory such as recent books by Shreko Horvat or Eva Horn. Posthumanism and ecological thinking have, of course, often gone hand in hand, and they still do. But only the past years have ecology and technology really found each other on a more conceptual level. And this connection is deepening, for example, in the work of Hales or Yu Kui. And this movement is also made in the arts, I think. And this shift is caused precisely by this ever more clear horizon of ends, finitude, and extinction past, present, and future. Verdunck's work suggests that extinction and ecological crisis pushes the post-human to the post-humus. Following thinkers like Claire Colbrook or Jimmy Weinstein's analysis, post-humanism mainly focused on how life and agency exist and work beyond the boundaries of the human and on how the human can be considered non-human by nature. The posthumus considers this non-human agency from the perspective of a potential extinction or end. Of course, you have to remain critical about attitudes towards extinction. They should not, for example, lead to a blanket acceptance, but rather it's interesting to analyze what kind of end narrative circulates and to seek out those that could produce a different ethics might foster a sense of care, a way of living that stays with the ends. I think we can see Verdunck's work in that way. His machines are also becoming increasingly independent, even indifferent to their human counterparts or human spectators, who are a bit lost, perplexed, or subsumed by these machines. And the fact that elements of sonography, or well, sonography sounds maybe too passive um, um, in performances of Verdunck, uh, such as Bogus One or Three, uh, are also presented as performative installations in museums and white cubes, as specters of what once might have been theater. Uh, I think it's quite telling in this sense. Machines have always had a profound impact on theater in Verdunck's work, but they are pushing it increasingly to its limits nowadays. 
The machines themselves have also become less mechanical in appearance and materiality and are approaching the organic with more attention for fabrics and subtle materials. For example, Mass 2, um, an installation made out of slowly revolving gray styrofoam beads. Or another installation, Detail, a large suspended rock that rotates on the rhythm of the sun. Um, detail is powered by solar energy, which is then directly transformed into this rotating movement. So it's kind of closed circuit. When the sun shines, it spins. When there is a cloud, it slows down. When it's dark, it stops. It thus has a kind of time and rhythm of its own, independent from further human interference. It now hangs in Verdung's atelier like a pet. It's a presence that is at once unsettling and makes one contemplate and look at one's own nothingness. Haunting, Mark Fisher writes, writes, can be construed as failed mourning. Spectrality in the theater or in the white cube could then offer maybe a possibility to mourn, not in a successful way that would separate the dead in a different realm and hence preserve life. Rather, it would allow a mourning that stays with the dead or stays with the ends. Spectrality sheds a shadow over the present, which with shadows coming from both the past and the future turns out to be quite dark. The question is, do we deny this or do we stay with it? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christoph. That's fabulous. I, um, did I go over or am I? A little, a little. Sorry, I, sorry. I sent, I sent you a message. It doesn't matter. Let's squeeze in one question. Oh, Jen, it's right in there. Jen, over to you. Thanks so much. I don't really have a question. I'm just... Um, just wanting to say thank you, Florence and Doug and Christoph, and, and hello. I haven't seen some of you in a while. Um, I'm really, this is such a fantastic way for me anyway to end the conference because it picks up on so many of the things that I was trying to get at, especially with what I would say those haunting um, um, kind of figures of that, that I presented at the end. And I, I know that you guys probably weren't all able to be at that talk, but what I'm interested in is how through the through the, the the threads through the past three days, there's been really strong threads around empathy, mm. and I, I'm very attracted to that. And I feel like I'm always reaching towards these objects, these non-humans, in ways that I'm always trying to figure out. There, but then also the other thread that's come through that you really bring up in a way, and and Doug did too, is violence and mm. the violence of the the past few decades and the violence of what we've gone through and the violence of technologies and in a way. So these two kind of um, these two kind of positions between empathy and violence, I think are really, really beautifully um, discussed in your work. Uh, and I think haunting is is maybe in the spectral are the ways to, to think about this because um, I'm, and I just I'm just it's just a comment to say that I think it's a, a really a really productive and beautiful way of thinking about those two, those two tensions that we have in dealing with the non-human and that we really want to be empathetic in some way, but there's also this violence and how those things get resolved is maybe through this haunting spectral um, positionality. Um, and, and I do think that there's something about the whole turn to new materialism that is coming out in work like Verdonks or Dusung Yu's um, because it is about it is about trying to find that empathy and trying to understand the non-human in a way that isn't just about an object to, to capitalize on, and and so it's a kind of um, you know there's a pull I guess is is the thing that I'm 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 trying to suggest that there's some kind of physical pull towards this that we're trying to figure out. But anyway, I just wanted to thank you. And, and those are just really reflections and, and to say that I think it really weaves together. This panel for me is really weaving together a lot of the themes that we've heard so far. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, maybe if I can quickly say something too. Um, we're, I, I'm, I'm sure we're not alone as being over. Let's just, put your, yours is the last comment, Crystal. Oh, but maybe I should stay quiet and listen to someone else then. It's, uh, if there is a... No, no, there is... Go on, go on, go on, Crystal. 
All right. No, I was thinking indeed that um, it's these are very seductive in a way, um, especially when we present the installations. Um, it's their materiality that um, often invites touch. Um, uh, we are um, attracted to them, mesmerized by them. Um, and for example, everybody wants to touch the rock or touch the inflatables or play in the sand, um, destroying the installation. Um, but at the same time, when you come to think about what these machines perform or what kind of situation they create, or, then there's a second moment of um, uh, might be a bit more dark or violent or sad or contemplative. So I think it's kind of a, a going back and forth indeed between them. When it comes to the materialism, for me, it helps to think very practically. Uh, whereas when I try to think more on the content level, I think more well, in those political economical terms uh, Doug has introduced. So I think it's two levels of working with machines and things. Uh, and one helps, uh, and one helps, and the other, and vice versa. Mm. Thank you very much. I think we are um, well over time. So thank you all. See you in the forum space. Thank you. Bye. Bye.